Well, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Hartman. I'm the executive director of the Bridges Sustainability Science Coalition and UNESCO's Management of Social Transformations Program. Uh, and uh, I'm here to open the session uh, on uh, youth-led knowledge and education for climate change and, and human security. Uh, I'd like to offer sincere thanks again to the organizing committee of of the Education for Human Security Conference and our partners at, at, at WAS uh, for inviting us to partner with them. And, uh, and um, you know, all the people who are involved in this session, and thank you for turning out uh, to join us, all of you um, who aren't presenting. Uh, this session is co-sponsored by Bridges uh, and the Turn It Around Initiative, both anchored at Arizona State University's Global Futures Laboratory and both supported by UNESCO. Uh, the session is, is organized in collaboration with the People and Planet Project, uh, the UNESCO Social and Human Sciences Sector, and the UNESCO Regional Office in Cairo. Our discussion today is, is focalized by the climate crisis, particularly as, the, as this global challenge impacts human security at many levels, regionally and, and locally. It's also aimed to address youth and knowledge, agency and action, uh, and how these do and perhaps must uh, come together to address the needs of human security. Climate change and human security are thus intertwined. Climate change can be a direct and indirect cause of conflict as it exacerbates key drivers of fragility, uh, such as the struggle for basic resources and livelihoods, the absence of which can lead to displacement and other forms of human vulnerability. Uh, and really, you know, here I'm cribbing really from one of the reports we're going to be hearing about shortly. Uh, the climate crisis uh, really thus has an undeniable impact on all elements of, of human security. This session will take up a number of distinct educational implications of organized efforts to address climate change related human insecurity, including how the educational sector in the broadest sense must be mobilized to better prepare for and, and mitigate uh, vulnerabilities with an emphasis on the central role of young people in societies around the world. Now, um, I am not going to say very much about Bridges, uh, other than I'll share our Bridges website URL, or maybe ask uh, if my co-moderator Juliana can do that in the chat window. Uh, uh, and if you want to go on our website, you can find out a little bit more about us. But what we are is the um, humanities-led sustainability science coalition uh, in UNESCO's management of social transformations program. And in that sense, we're meant to bridge and complement uh, other existing sustainability programs internationally um, that have more of a, a, a long, longer standing rooting in, in technical fields and in natural sciences. Uh, and uh, I think that in the process of talking a little bit more through the, the course of the Q&A today, we may be able to reveal a little bit more about what Bridges is trying to do. But really what I want to do more than anything is to jump into the discussion and to the, the presentation of the three reports that are at the heart of this session today. And these reports are um, from the People in uh, Planet Project, the, the European Youth and Climate Change a Community Baseline Report. Um, and then the regional report on knowledge for youth-led climate action in the Arab region. Uh, which was a UNESCO report. And then finally, the uh, Turn It Around, uh, an education guide to climate futures report, all of which came out in the last year, a couple of them just in the last several months, uh, and um, have come together. They have uh, knowledge, they have youth, they have climate change and the needs uh, and the, the sort of security needs, the human security needs implicated. I think in each of the re these reports in different ways are, are worth digging into a little bit more. And that's what I hope we're gonna have an opportunity to do today with all of you. Um, so before I turn it over to the first speaker, who's Telmo Simos, I, I hope I'm not really uh, making a travesty of your last name pronunciation there, Telmo, uh, but you can pronounce it yourself the correct way if I got it wrong, but I'm gonna turn it over to Telmo from the People and Planet Project to begin with. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to throw out a question 
um, that maybe we could hold in the back of our head as we're listening to each of the summaries of the reports and we begin our Q&A. And namely, that's what are the human security issues that impact uh, youth's education and learning? Um, and maybe there will be an opportunity in the presentations or following the presentations to circle back to that question. So we're going to be hearing from Telmo, from people on the planet. We're going to be hearing from Marwa al um, presenting the author of the UNESCO report uh, on the uh, Arab region. And we're going to be hearing from Professor Iveta Solova uh, from ASU on the Turn It Around project. And I'm going to start things off by turning things over to you, Telmo. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the, the introduction. Um, my name is Telmo Simões, but I know that <laughs> that is a, a very hard one to, to get. So, uh, And thank you also, Bridges, for the invitation to be here. I'll just uh, share um, uh, my screen with a brief presentation on the, the introduction that I would like to, to share about our, our project. Uh, let me put this on full screen. OK. Um, and yes, I am here representing our project People and Planet. Our project has the, the main goal of addressing the SDGs agenda by working with, uh, on one hand, local authorities and also with uh, young European citizens to address the challenges and consequences of climate change and with the specific focus on water scarcity. And this part, I think, will be very important also in this connection with human security. Um, in our report, uh, as you said, it is a baseline survey. Uh, it is called European Youth and Climate Change. We wanted to explore the relation between young people and climate change. Uh, on one hand, their knowledge and perception surrounding the topic, also between individual actions that they already perform or that they are interested in performing. And lastly, their awareness regarding policy action on this matter. Um, and what this report showed on various levels is that young people already feel their security threatened by the impact of climate crisis. So we can see uh, right from the start some connection with the topic of this conference. Uh, as general statements regarding uh, that connection, we can see that young people uh, identify climate change as having an impact on every continent and every ocean in the past decades. This is indeed a global phenomenon. Uh, we see young people convinced or at least having some doubts uh, whether the damage that we have done to the environment is something that is permanent or not, uh, or if it can be reversed. And um, we see young people also, now more specifically related to the issue of water scarcity, as having a major influence on future conflicts and migration of people, also something that is very related to, to the notion of security. Um, our report also asked about the global, cons um, the global consequences of climate change. So now narrowing down the, the focus a bit more, you know, what are the particular issues that uh, are causing young people to consider uh, their safety threatened when we consider climate change? And most young people, more than 18 each 10, identified at least one of these environmental problems as having a major impact on the global scale. Some of them are highly influential on the security we traditional sense, we traditionally sense as human beings. For example, the air we breathe, uh, the rising sea levels, which can severely impact uh, densely populated cities, um, or forest fires and floods. These two, for example, uh, as around 87% of young people saying, that there will be a, a that there is already a, a big global impact on forest fires and floods. So the two sides they are contrary, but they are very much related to one another. Um, lastly, I also want to address water scarcity with eighty three percent, just to name a, a few of the of the issues. And when we ask these young people if they are already feeling these impacts personally. Uh, because we know that security issues start to be more pressing when they affect each person's individual existence, these numbers decline slightly. So these are the numbers for the, the global impact. When we ask about personal impact, they de decline a bit, but still around six in each uh, 10 young people are stating that these issues are already having a major impact on their lives. So this is already something that is present. It's not just in the future. We can also 
um, see how closely tied together are the notions of climate change and human security with these topics. Uh, for young people, these things go uh, hand in hand, but what can we do to improve the situation? And that is where education comes in. Looking at our report, we identified one uh, aspect that is clear where education can play an important role. The knowledge regarding national and international policies uh, in related to climate change. We found out that little more than half young people know about the national policies that exist to tackle climate change and around 71% about international initiatives. And the People on Planet Project thinks that it is of the utmost importance to raise this knowledge because it's only by having people know what the actions are uh, that the institutions are committed to take. Um, only by knowing that we can assess if they are being successful, if they are being honored, or if they are being sufficient. Also, with the underlying causes of climate change, education can help a lot. Um, luckily, we are seeing a global movement that is putting the, the stress that climate change deserves in the public eye, but not so much with the connections between all these related topics. In this case, for example, we see that water scarcity is a much less sexier topic um, to address when comparing to climate change. But this is a part that is completely dependent on each another. So the People and Planet Project thinks that uh, we really need education to help young people identify the connections between all the climate change underlying causes and effects, its connection to human security, and all the actions we can take to mitigate the coming effects of uh, climate change and its consequences. Our project has been working closely uh, both with the local authorities, both with the young people in schools, uh, with teachers. Um, we have this connection between young people and uh, the local power to try to um, create meaningful actions that people can improve their knowledge and also uh, the action already to mitigate the effects of climate change. And for now, Stephen, uh, thank you very much. I'll leave it on here. And I'm eager also to hear what my colleagues have to share regarding this topic. Okay, thanks very much, Telmo. That, that, was, that, that was very uh, informative and uh, I, I appreciate uh, that breakdown that you gave us in a very short form. I'd like to invite uh, Marwa Al Cairo now to come in and um, give us a presentation on the UNESCO report. Sure. Well, thank you, Stephen, uh, for the introduction. And thank you also to the last speakers for having us today on this really important topic. When we first thought of the UNESCO report oh, over a year now, we were looking at the state of climate action throughout the Arab region. We wanted to understand what is happening. What are young people throughout the Arab region, from Mauritania all the way to Yemen, doing? especially when we think about the context of the region, when we think about the political situation, the social situation, the socioeconomic situation, the civil strife that's taking place in a number of countries across the region. What is that level of importance that young people are associating to climate change? How are they understanding that interplay between climate change and the other realities that they're living on a day-to-day -day basis? So when we thought of when we first the, the UNESCO report really looks at the dimension of knowledge as it is linked to youth led climate action, it is not necessarily a study of young people's knowledge of climate action as much as it is, what are those processes that they're engaging in? So number one, what are the sources that they are obtaining to gain knowledge, to obtain knowledge about climate change? What are they generating? What are they producing? What are their outputs when it comes to the field of climate change? And three, how are they disseminating that knowledge and how are they making an impact? And what is their own self-perception of impact at the same time on a country level, on a regional level, and on a global level as well? What we saw is, is that knowledge is really at the heart. It's at the core of youth climate action activities. On one level, we were able to develop a landscape analysis of who, who, who youth climate actors are across the region, which was not done before. And on another level, we were also able to understand what are those key challenges when it comes to the education, to the knowledge dimension that young people are facing. 
we saw more and more that the localized need of understanding climate change is critical. What we also saw is how climate change was understood has a very strong interplay and there's a nexus between climate change, climate action, and knowledge production at the same time. Two key areas came out of this when it comes to the issue of security and youth climate action. One, young people feel because of the different security situations that are on the ground in uh, the, across the Middle East and across North Africa, they see that perhaps climate change is not always the priority. So in a country like Iraq or in Syria or Yemen or other countries, for example, where there are met, there's political strife, there's not necessarily an understanding of why climate change would necessarily be a priority. Although, as we know, that there is an interplay, that there is a connection, that there is a nexus between different security issues and climate change as an, ex as an existential crisis is very much interlinked with different political, economic, uh, security notions of security at the same time. However, young people are trying to self-justify the work in climate action as they seek a desire for livelihood, as they want to live, as they want to be able to just really make it through the day. So that was one bucket of security issues that really came up and how they interacted with the issue of climate action and its prioritization. Two is the reality on the ground due to the complex realities in the Middle East, uh, as, as I had just noted, the research and development sector in general is one that is not very developed. So we're we, we are looking at figures where about 1%, a little over 1% of knowledge production in climate change is being produced across the region. This is a very low percentage, especially when thinking about the, 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 the numbers and how climate change is um, quickly uh, impacting the region and even more so in the coming years to come. So here, how young people interplay with it is that okay, it's a priority, it's a growing sector. It's something that they realize that they want to focus on, that they want to work in, but they're not necessarily finding a research and development space or arena or an enabling environment that allows them to foster the type of knowledge production that they need in order to be able to create localized knowledge, in order to be responsive, and in order to preempt a lot of the issues that are required on the ground when it comes to addressing climate change in the region. So, due to the security situation in a lot of the countries, due to what the prioritization is in a lot of the countries, this is not one that's necessarily always there in the education sector. There's programs that are increasing, there are universities that are taking it on. However, we're talking about consistency, we're talking about a systematic approach, especially when we're looking at something as existential for the region and also globally at the same time. So these are really the two core areas that we really see as we look at this nexus between climate change, climate action, and knowledge, and what I'll look forward to engaging with colleagues on as well um, in our discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Mara. Um, uh, also very rich, uh, short presentation. So I look forward to following through on our discussion about this afterwards. I'd like to now um, invite uh, uh, my colleague Iveta Solova from um, Arizona State University and Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College and the Global Futures Laboratory there to tell us about uh, the Turn It Around report. Thank you so much, everybody. And I wanted to introduce also my colleague. Um, our report is called Turn It Around, Use Visions of Education Futures, and it directly addresses the questions, uh, the question about the role of education in turning around the environmental catastrophe as one of the central human security concerns. So we started with the uh, assumptions that education itself is directly implicated in the climate crisis and our failure to imagine alternatives. Despite efforts to promote education as key to achieving sustainable lives, including the Sustainable Development Goal 4 that designates education um, as a priority or the UN's Education for Sustainable Development decades that we are just uh, coming to a close completion, education systems continue to perpetuate the logic of human exceptionalism and emphasize education's impact on economic growth over other areas of impact, such as environmental sustainability. In fact, schools and universities continue to maintain the status quo that reproduces the very hierarchical man over nature relationship and promotes the idea that humans are separate from and above nature and thus um, actively further exacerbating the climate crisis. So in this um, reports that we have produced, 
our goal was to bring together the visions and voices of youth artists and activists from across the world in a collective effort to radically reimagine education in order to address the root causes of the climate crisis. And so we see education as one of the root causes. The, we crowdsourced these youth visions of education futures in a form of art and text responses and uh, really tried to engage climate activists, youth activists that are may not be known in the international arena, in media, but they are everyday climate activists that deal, um, that live with climate crisis in um, you know, their daily context. So our goal was to center these voices um, in order to re-articulate education as part of the solution rather than part of the problem in the climate crisis um, context that we uh, are existing right now. And in this process, we wanted to mobilize, as I said, the power of socially engaged art and science and appeal to policymakers on an aesthetic and affective level to move them into more immediate action and long-term policy planning as well that acknowledges intergenerational, cross-cultural and multi-species interdependence and justice. And I'm looking forward to discussing some of the details of this report with you, but this is a very brief context for why and how this report was um, co-produced and co-led by um, children and youth um, around the world under from as young as six years old and uh, up until 35 years old. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Veda. And um, again, so much, um, so much uh, to go on here in this next stage of our discussion, which I'm going to turn over. By the way, I'll just mention though in the chat window, each of the reports and links to each of the reports is being posted in the chat window. So uh, please check those out. And uh, I want to turn over now to my colleague. Uh, Juliana Gavich, uh, the capacity building lead in the Bridges uh, Coalition based at Arizona State University, who's my co-moderator and who's going to lead the next part of this discussion. Juliana. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you to all of our fabulous panelists. Um, I just want to give a special shout out and uh, celebration of Women's International uh, Women's Day that's today, and uh, also to acknowledge the fabulous women who are um, a part of this panel discussion. And um, thank you all for the, the opportunity to be able to learn with and from you today. Um, so we're gonna move into a discussion phase. I have some predetermined questions, but I wanna encourage again, as I posted sure. in the chat, to have folks who are listening in um, and are able to please raise a question, either post it by in the chat or there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom link for those joining on YouTube, uh, the live stream aspect of this. Apologies, we're not able to kind of manage both platforms, but um, we would love to hear from you later on. So we'll definitely post some contact information. Um, with that said, um, I'd like to get us started with an opening question to kind of frame this again in the context of education for human security. Um, Stephen had kind of posed a, a bit of this earlier on, but to get a little bit more into the weeds here, um, one of the key things I'd like to ask all of our panelists and feel free to respond. Also, if those from the participant pool would like to um, add their comments in the chat and respond to this, these questions, we definitely welcome it. Um, so for everybody, what are some of these key challenges? We started to hear a little bit about this, but from the educators and practitioner side, what are they facing in empowering youth as agents of change, whether it's in the climate crisis or beyond? Um, how can they also support youth in realizing their full potential as eco-minded citizens when they're trying to grapple with these multifaceted challenges of human security? Um, and thinking about human security more broadly um, from the human to the ecological, as well as given it's International Women's Day, you know, some gender equity issues that might be interplaying into this mix here, um, which are really prevalent in the context of educational transformation. So that was a lot to kind of consider, but um, I'd love to hear more elaboration on some of those challenges that you've all faced or learned about through the work you're conducting. Thank you, Juliana, and I can get started um, for and, and look forward to hearing from the colleagues and attendees as well. I mean, as I alluded to in my earlier opening comments, um, for educators here, I think a big part of the challenge is that climate change is so complex and it's so 
interdisciplinary in, in, in the different issues that you can look at it from, whether it's the political, whether it's the social, whether it's the economic, whether it's the ecological, environmental. It's 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 a big, it's a big Medusa's box of so many different issues that are all interconnected. And I think there really needs to be on an educational level a very strong recognition of the complexity of this. And at the same time, a recognition of the importance of the research and development sector um, and the support of professors of academia, of those who are working in different cross academic activist spaces at the same time in order to be able to bolster the type of work that address this complex challenge. This is a multi-societal um, undertaking and many different brains, many different minds, many different types of interlocutors in society, whether it's through academia, whether it's through uh, civil society, whether it's government, which is public sector, it needs to come together. And I think how big it is, is almost how complicated it is. But I think really by um, investing in enabling an environment, a research and development uh, space, um, this could really help educators really feel that there is some level of ownership that they could also start to take and what they need to do for themselves to develop their own skills, their own knowledge, their own abilities, and that's going to trickle down then to their students as well so as they're able to support them also. That takes a lot of resources, a lot of strategizing. It's not necessarily easy, but that's really the type of scale that we need in order to address how complex this issue is. Thank you, Mara. And you point out something really crucial here, which is that maybe the capacity is not fully there yet from the educator practitioner side to really help open the door for more youth engagement and leadership in that space. So really wonderful. Um, any other speakers want to uh, respond to that question? Uh, thank you, Ju Juliana. I can compliment a bit on that. And thank you, Mara, for your uh, perspective. Um, I, I think that is a very good starting point. And I think the next step is when we get that, that knowledge, that uh, competence to, to share with young people, I think it's, sometimes it's very hard to, to balance the interest um, that young people have towards these topics. Because on the one hand, you cannot uh, or you should not maybe um, uh, share these messages like, this is your life mission in a way, because it can overwhelm young people, you know? Uh, and sometimes young people might be, maybe I'm not cut out for it, you know? Maybe I don't have the competence for it because this is such a huge task. This is such an important task that I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have the competences to do it. But on the other hand, we, we cannot say, oh, this is, there is no problem with this. We don't have to do anything. So this balance, you know, that's, we have to 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 spread to young people uh, step by step. There's always always something that we can do. Uh, you don't have to be scared. You don't have to be overwhelmed. You can start uh, to um, take part in the in the climate action step by step. Uh, do your part, and there are things that you can do easily. That you don't need to be an expert. You don't you don't need to devote your life to do it to to contribute. And I think that's balance of interest is very, very uh, important to, to get right. The other one that I, I would like to share also very, very fast, that is, uh, is more related to, to our project uh, in regards to local authorities is to get the interest of local authorities to, to get um, their uh, availability because sometimes local authorities have their own, own agenda, schools have their own agendas. When, and when you are trying to balance the interests of local authorities, the interests of schools, of young people, of the project itself, it's very hard to, to get a, a good balance, to get everyone to agree on what to do, how to do it. And sometimes it's, it's tricky to do it right. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, you raised a really important point about sort of balancing the potentially conflicting agendas and how do we make the case for integration and show the, the interconnections across these different human security and educational challenges, as well as how do we better um, address these from an educational level in a more holistic perspective that really is sort of targeting multiple pathways towards solutions for um, things like climate change and, and beyond. Um, there's also links to a question that was posted by one of our um, participants. Sorry, there's some background noise. Um, posted by one of our participants, Dr. Lucy Altala, um, who asks, do you think learning about climate change fosters action or perhaps that the dystopian future it suggests creates a sense of powerlessness? Um, for example, do you think sitting in classes that conceptualize the future, future crafting might be useful to move 
uh, into a world youth wants. So this idea of dystopian futures and sort of the, the sense of powerlessness, how might we actually counteract that from an educational uh, approach? Any thoughts on that? I think, um, Yvette, you might actually have some really good thoughts around the turn it around perspective and the work you're doing there. Yeah, thank you. And I'll actually also circle back to your initial question and connect yes. to this one, because I think the it, it, from our perspective, the biggest barrier actually is the um, lack of space for the participation of ch children and youth in the decision making about their own futures, right, and frustration that comes with it. Um, especially when it comes to the climate um, related issues, because they are very rarely at the table making the decisions, right? And just as an example, um, you know, one, the, the, you know, really powerful UNESCO's Futures of Education report that was uh, just published last year had a really excellent uh, committee, steering committee of experts who participated in uh, guiding the development of the report but that committee did not include any single youth representative, right? Instead, the committee decided to um, consult, do a round of uh, very wide consultations with youth, but as also Antonio Guterres actually um, very clearly said at the, the UN Transforming Education Summit in September, consultation is not enough. Right, we cannot simply consult anymore and then not do anything about it. Right, not do anything with the visions and ideas um, that children and youth bring to the table. So, uh, the from our perspective, how can we make the space for children and youth to participate in meaningful ways, and not only to view them as very passive consultants, right, who can provide some kind of information or inform some kind of decision, but then um, are left out from very, very vital decisions that are uh, part of their lives, right? In fact, many people, young people actually talk about um, the lack of action, uh, lack of their participation and a lack of action on behalf of policymakers. They really see it as a death sentence, right? It's that... Um, that's a type of radical language that they use. And so the biggest barrier, I think, actually is maybe not more education, not more opportunities to do something, but it's um, actually opening the space and helping policymakers, teachers, educators understand how we can work on the climate issues together and not um, separate different groups of people, right? How can we mobilize forces and begin making some of these decisions together and also be responsible for this decision-making decision, decision -making together rather than um, handing over responsibility to future generations? Such an important point, Aveta. Um, the meaningful engagement is sort of how I frame that a lot in terms of youth as well as other marginalized voices. But that meaning making is so key here. And too often it's sort of this tokenism or participatory models that are very much about exploiting and almost like uh, holding up as like trophies rather than actually engaging them and allowing them to be them as youth to be like the leaders in that forefront and not be sort of the passive recipients of that um or sort of the the ones that can be celebrated and highlighted when it's appropriate but not necessarily fully engaged in the the um instrumental uh decision making processes so you bring into the mix here some um uh, you know highlights of different questions around um how we link the work of um, intervention and actually create space for youth to fit into those intervention points as leaders um, and pathways um, that can actually open the door to that. And I'd like to um, raise into the mix here a little bit about sort of some of the educational transformation perspectives that you uh, alluded to with the UNESCO's report uh, on reimagining our futures together, a new social contract, as well as the subsequent report, Beyond Limits, New Ways to Reinvent Higher Education. And in that latter report, they, they point to different principles that are at the core of this educational transformation mission. And those include uh, things like inclusion, equity, participation of all stakeholders, critical thinking, creativity, sustainability, social responsibility, and values. So I'd like to ask our speakers um, to really think through how those uh, principles 
keeping those in mind, what are some of those integral intervention points that can have the transformational potential in educational systems, both formal and informal. So we're thinking about learning across the lifespan here as well. Um, and how like the learning uh, ideologies as well as practices can really spark um, education as protectors and catalysts for human environmental flourishing. So what are some of those things, particularly from the youth perspective? Uh, and Mara, you also started to talk about some of those things in the chat uh, in response to another question, which I'm hoping to get to as well, but I'd love to hear more reflection on that, um, particularly from the youth perspective, how we can better integrate them as interveners and agents of change. Again, that question of agency is so key here. So any thoughts on that? No, thank you for that, Juliana. And thank you, Dr. Elena, for the question as well. I'll try to integrate both. I mean, I think what you were saying, Iveta and Juliana, what you continued on in terms of meaningful engagement, I think I love the term meaningful engagement. A lot of times in positive youth development, it's, you know, refraining from tokenism, but I like the positive side of looking at that, which is meaningful engagement, which is which is the terminology that you utilize. I think, and that is what youth want. I mean, when we were doing the, the UNESCO report, a big part of different, whether it was from the regional survey, which whether it was focus group discussions, whether it was in-depth interviews we were having with them, the constant theme in every single discussion that I was told was we want to be meaningfully engaged. We don't just want to sit around a table where our name is listed on a nice list and that's it, you know, and, and, and we're not engaged in any way. They really want to feel ownership. I think the one area and where I always want to come Come back in a dose of reality, not to be pessimistic, but really because I think reality is what we need to discuss in order sometimes to be able to see what are those barriers that we need to get to. We can, there can be all sorts of wonderful programs for meaningful engagement. There can be all sorts of, you know, wonderful UN initiatives, international organization initiatives, local initiatives that do this. The issue is that there are systematic realities on the ground, for example, where in some countries, civil society is limited, where in some country, there isn't necessarily a prioritization of climate change or other sort of things, where education systems are stalled, for example, and that there needs to be a complete uplifting, a renaissance of sorts, you know, for these education systems to revitalize themselves in order to be able to get to the crux of some of these issues. And so I think where the challenge is, is that youth want this ownership, they want to be able to engage, they want to be able to take on this responsibility, but there's also realities and barriers that they're faced with that they also want to see that that, that they that need to be overcome, essentially, at the same time. And so uh, to your question, Dr. Elena, there are lots of initiatives, you know, cross-regional initiatives, UN initiatives, global regional initiatives that bring in youth to transfer of knowledge, you know, learning from different experiences, coming together to find solutions. And these are wonderful and they're a good start and, and they should continue. But what time and again, what they said is, and I, I heard this earlier in our conversation, is that they want localized knowledge. They want localized ability and local response, and they want the local authorities to be able to say, we hear you, and we're going to listen to you, and we're going to do reforms in our societies to be able to make these changes for you. So this is where the rubber meets the, you know, where, where it gets a little bit um, tense because it's we want to we want to be able to respond, but how is it when the macro is impacting what needs to be done on the day to day? Um, and I think that's the million dollar question. Um, but it doesn't mean that we don't go forward and continue with these efforts. I think we just always try to see because otherwise it could be, be harmful if we don't if we don't address realities, if we don't look at barriers, and we try to keep pushing, but we're not understanding the realities on the ground. That's when a harmful approach can happen. So it's always trying to minimize that, address their needs, and at the same time, understand the realities at the same time. You're, you're highlighting something really key here, Mara, which the, we need to be doing both simultaneously, the uh, very individual communal intervention points and transformations, as well as this deep systemic levels that you can't ignore, but you have to acknowledge as you're trying to address and intervene at different levels in society. Otherwise, you're going to come up against the wall at a certain point and you're going to become disillusioned by the fact that you can't move forward or that you're not having the lasting impact that you envisioned. Uh, and that can become really demoralizing, especially for young change agents who basically are being promised 
these opportunities and then it's almost like the rugs pulled out from under them um, at a certain point right because the reality sets in that oh sorry this is not actually going to become a policy opportunity of uh, we're not going to make these changes locally or whatever like there could be countless reasons but um thanks for highlighting that any other thoughts on that question about intervention points where do we begin what are some of the key strategies that you have already started utilizing in your work I'd like to maybe really quickly to follow up on Maurer's um, intervention because it's really, really powerful, but also to highlight that it brings so many tensions, uh, you know, to the surface, right? And one of them, so on the one hand, yes, we need to address basic education needs first, right, and make sure that, you know, access to uh, basic education, higher education is available to everybody, but at the same time, I think you are also really aware that the same type of education that we have been uh, providing to the population for the last two um, decades have not really been successful, right? It actually may have even further uh, put us into the climate crisis context, right? And David Orr has, I think a couple of decades ago already said that more, of the same type of education will really not help solve our problems, right? So how do we at, one, at once open access to education and address the basic needs, but at the same time transform radically the system, right? And it's so uh, difficult to do and almost uh, may seem as an impossible um, thing to do, but I think it is possible to do maybe um, even uh, it, 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 from multiple angles, but even in very small actions, right? Whether it's at the classroom level or community level or other levels. But in our report, so we, the use actually highlighted several different turns that we can make. And that's why we called the report, turn it around. One of the reasons, one of them was this intergenerational turn, which I already mentioned before too, where the knowledge is not seen as hierarchical and passed down from adults to children, but maybe co-produced. Um, by multiple generations and uh, maybe not only humans, but also more than humans. They talked about the pedagogical turn that would move us away from this re uh, relying on individualism and independence or child-centeredness and more towards the interdependence and interconnectedness of every everyone and everything on um, as part of the Earth's ecological community. And they also talked a lot about the decolonial turn that cuts across the different established hierarchies of knowledge, right? And perhaps decenters the Western knowledge and makes uh, some space for indigenous knowledges, non-Western philosophies, eco-activist, uh, eco-feminist knowledges that um, give us maybe more conceptual tools to think with and uh, make a change. Thank you, Stephen. I saw your hands up, um, but I just wanted to note to Aveta that those turns are fantastic and really great starting points. Uh, I'd love to circle back to some of these um, discussions as well as uh, as we wrap up. But Stephen, I want to give you a chance to talk about. Yeah, I, I, uh, Aveta said a couple of the things that um, I, I was interested in going that direction. I had a second uh, thing that uh, I didn't think there'd be time for, but so it's not to repeat some of the topics that Aveda just took up. I'm going to go to the thing I was going to uh, speak about second, which was essentially a response to one of the questions that or observations that Lucia Tala put in the chat window about thinking about conceptions of human relations with the environment and the sense of separation that might encourage doing damage to the world. And I think that it may be useful to think both in an educational perspective, but also in a human uh, security perspective about planetary security. Um, in this um, sort of uh, more holistic sense. Uh, and I'd like to suggest that, you know, planetary security is always human security, while being much more than human security. But human security is not necessarily always or entirely planetary security. Um, and I think that this is, these are, um, uh, this se seems to be what Lucy's comment was sort of driving at. And I think that also, it, it, it dovetails with uh, the turning to other kind of non-Western, non-sort um, of uh, sacralized uh, um, uh, uh, Western knowledge systems, uh, academic knowledge systems that that we maybe uh, could be learning more from. So we think about the principle of intergenerational knowledge as being not just about older people learning from young people, but generations across generations co-producing together. I think we 
really need to be doing more of that as well with uh, with our sisters and brothers from traditional communities who um, who have tremendous wisdom and knowledge um, that is um, just not um, being heard enough in the sort of mainstream. So th those are just some thoughts I had that were sparked by Lucy's question. Thanks, Stephen. And as we're coming to the end of our time, um, hopefully we can go over a little bit, but I'd love to pose one more major question, which is what's one commitment to action that each of you are willing or able to make in addressing some of these challenges? We talked a lot about the barriers, and, but I'd love to hear sort of what are some pathways forward from your perspectives? Uh, Marwa, I see you. Yes, no, I actually just wanted to comment on um, Stephen's comment to Lucy's comment, which is I really appreciate that comment um, that yes, a lot of time it's it's Western, you know, Western ideas, Western research that really takes a predominant and a lot of the research that is coming out in this field is, of course, it is coming out from the West, but the amount of learning that's also coming out, for example, in the Arab region and other parts of the world, there's a plethora. The thing is, is that it's not always exposed. There's not because the reason the R&D sector is not as flourishing here. You're not seeing the articles. The world isn't seeing the articles. They're not seeing what's being published. They're not necessarily seeing the research that's happening whether it's here, whether it's other parts of the world, but it is happening and there is an engagement with these issues that's happening. And there's so much learning that could happen at the same time. And so I just want to, I just appreciate that comment because I think that was also a frustration that was shared from the youth is that we are doing, we are producing, we are generating, but it's not necessarily always being heard. We're not always necessarily having the platform in order to be able to share what it is that we're doing. And I'm sure that's not only something in, in this region, but also in many parts of the world as well, where they feel that there's a misrepresentation and that they could be represented even more in their work. So thanks for that comment. Wonderful. Do you have any thoughts on how to better leverage that um, knowledge coalition, if you will, um, be able to pull those knowledge to the forefront and, and create space for that in some more accessible ways. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I think it's really um, it's support, it's word of mouth. There's efforts in the region, for example, that are creating coalitions, cross collaborations, whether it's between different countries, different sub regions of the region, different global initiatives as well. I think more and more as young people are engaging in different regional and global activities as well, this is really giving a platform. Um, and also, as there's so many online platforms for them to be sharing their work, they're also seeing it as a place. So social media for a lot of these young people actually is a knowledge source, it's a knowledge creator, and it's a knowledge disseminator all at the same time. And they're really seeing this space as being able to do that. And I think more and more as young people take on um, you know, become engaged in youth climate action. And, and I respect, you know, Telmo's point that, you know, not everybody is going to want to do this, not necessarily everyone is going to take on this responsibility for, but those for who those who do want to take this on, for those who do believe that this is an area of work they want in, there's a lot of different initiatives that are there. And I think really awareness, spreading knowledge, spreading word of mouth, um, now people creating networks with one another, coalitions with one another, um, whether across sectors uh, is really going to really help and having a lot of that work um, come to fruition and come and we have more exposure as well. Thank you. How about from Telmo and Aveta, would you like to share any commitments to action that you're willing or able to take? Can maybe I, I pick up on and compliment on what Mara was was telling, and I think it's one thing that was occurring to me is that it's it's a bit important not to look at knowledge just as a cold art fact information in a way, but also in an empathic way. You know, uh, like Iveta was saying uh, a while ago, um, we are doing this action together, all of us together, right? So when we are looking at what we perceive as knowledge regarding climate action, if, if we pick up, for example, on the localization of the SDGs, for example, um, it, it is just as simple as looking at um, each person reality, like, like Mara was saying, for example, and understanding that we, we have to start from that uh, basis, right? We are looking at your, uh, your reality, sorry, and figuring out what is important uh, to your life, to your um, security uh, that we, we start doing, you know? And also as global citizens, uh, when we start talking about uh, uh, 
our own action, right? We, we start on our reality, but we know that our actions have consequences on the other side of the planet. And when we were talking a while ago on uh, if this um, frightens young people to act or not, I think it's also a motivator, you know, when we, we, we tell them and we all of us together realize that the actions that we do here have an impact on the other side of the world. I think they are motivated to, to take part on this discussion and on this uh, global action. So I think the, the idea that I would leave here is that uh, really the importance of trying to also to bring a bit of empathy and the human side of uh, climate action, because like, like Stephen was saying, um, there is the, the, the harm that we are doing to the planet, but that can also um, signify harm done to people living on this planet. And I think if we, if we really can uh, share this message with young people, and not only young people, obviously, I think it's much easier for people to understand the, the seriousness of, of this issue and the urgency that there is to, to start acting. Thank you, Tilmo. How about you, Iveta, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I think one thing that we can do is continue to um, dialogue with uh, all of our colleagues at multiple generations about the really critical emergencies that we are all facing, right? And uh, I think it is in our power to really spark these dialogues to that may also push people into action, right? To motivate them to move into action. And we continue to do it uh, through this uh, Turn It Around project, um, which is a really interesting and helpful tool that can be used with multiple groups to initiate conversations about the role of education in the uh, climate crisis and planetary security. And, um, but there are many, many ways to do it, right? So this is just one of the tools. I also wanted to share this call to action that we have created a couple of years ago to share with educators, again, to think what as educators in our own context, we could do to uh, support students, work together with students for this common cause. And um, I think it's this, the, if nothing else, it's really the coming together and amplifying the synergies that we all have to um, make this radical change that we need to before it's too late. Thank you, Aveta. And um, if I could quickly summarize just a, as a way of showing the wealth of knowledge and um, commitments here. We have the idea of strengthening co-creation of and access to culturally appropriate context specific climate and human ecological security knowledges, prioritizing engagement, experiential or applied knowledge and learning across geographies, cultures and generations, bringing in empathy and the human side of climate action into different learning domains, continuing to dialogue with our colleagues as international learning stewards to motivate action. And I would just like to add, to celebrate our collective capacities uh, for being able and willing to commit to intervening in these really challenging complex spaces. So I'll turn it over to you, Stephen, and thank everybody, uh, both participants and panelists for a wonderful session today. Thanks very much. I wanna thank everyone as well, and uh, and really just uh, thank all of the panelists and our um, the other people who have joined us today for this discussion. Um, it was really um, um, an excellent opportunity to be able to have this discussion, and I look forward to continuing it um, in other um, bridges, WAS, and turn it around in ASU and People and Planet and UNESCO collaborations. And uh, since this is co-sponsored really by Turn It Around too, uh, Veda, would you like to say anything before we wrap up? No, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and for all of the amazing um, panelists and, uh, and the, such a great audience and their really thoughtful questions. So um, thank you, everybody.